All right, so welcome back. So we're going to be talking today about grayscales. And so the fundamental idea of drawing, giving that three-dimensional, that, that form uh, that we talk about, that volume of stuff, we use values. And there are lots of values in the world around us, um, but most people can't see beyond 17 to 20 steps of value with the human eye. They can't perceive any more than that. So what we do is we simplify that, those values into a 10-step value scale. These are our notes, if you will, as artists uh, for making a drawing. And so right here I've got a little grayscale that I have that's painted in oil. Uh, with the grayscale we have 10 steps of value that are supposed to be transitioning from light all the way to the dark is dark. And with the value scale, most commonly with the value scale, we'll start with 10, you know, up here at the top, going down 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, being the very darkest on the value scale. Now, if you come across an older value scale, those numbers might be switched. Uh, when I was trained, they were the opposite, and that's because it was based on printmaking. And so, one was 10% black, 20% black, all the way down to step 10, which was 100% black, as dark as you could go. Um, but these days, it's been changed, uh, just to pre and, uh, and maybe it has to do with how much light is there, and because of the, you know, a lot of uh, people painting digitally and dealing with pixels and light and things like that. But the most common that you'll find these days is it's starting with 10 and going down all the way to 1, not zero, but one uh, on the value scale. Now this is almost straight black and this is straight right white. Technically, uh, some people will say, well, there's never anything really white, there's never anything really truly black, and it's somewhere in between the two. Um, but again, this is a simplification uh, of value. And this is paint. And so sometimes we have, and with a value scale, you have a medium that can't they can't get the full range. Like this paper is fairly white, but this is graphite, so the darkest dark we're going to be able to get is probably somewhere about here. Uh, but we're st still going to break those down into 10 steps. So sometimes the medium that you're working with uh, will have some limitations in how, in how dark they can go, graphite being one of them. If I was working in charcoal, charcoal can go almost uh, because of the fact that Oil paint has a little bit of sheen to it. This seems deeper than what it is. And so charcoal is matte. Uh, so it seems like the charcoal is, is kind of up here when, anyways. But charcoal will give you a very, a nice broad range in that value scale, more so than graphite. And that's okay. Uh, a lot of people that work in graphite, they work in the lighter range. They like that range. That's why they work in graphite. Uh, some people want a fuller range of expression, or they like working in the darks. And if you're if you really like working with those rich darks, charcoal is the natural choice uh, for drawing. Now, so we're going to go ahead and create one of these grayscales in graphite. It's very light, um, and the camera, I've got, I've got so much light on here because I want you to be able to see the values really, really well. Um, but I don't know if you can pick this up, but it's been drawn lightly. I've, it's an inch and a half uh, rectangle that's been divided into one inch increments. So it's basically one and a half inches wide by 10 inches tall. And it has, you know, 10 little boxes. Every inch became a box. And so I've got 10 little boxes I'm going to turn into a grayscale using my pencils. So again, the, and the reason, the way we use the grayscale is to evaluate values. Uh, and so when people start drawing, I recommend that they either buy a value scale or create a value scale or download one or print it off. Sometimes when you print off, it can be off a computer, it can be kind of problematic because if you don't have a good printer, uh, then you don't get the, the nice steps of value. Each one of these steps is supposed to be equally distant from the previous step. And that way, when you're drawing you know, on an object, you can say, well, let's see, I'm dealing with the lit part of this object, and it might be up here, and then, but the dark part of that object is down here. And so you get very you want to be very adept. And so if I called out, hey, that's a number three on the value scale, people go, oh, I know what that is. I know where that is without having to look. And that takes time, just like learn to play the piano. You know, after, you know people say, well, it's, it's a D flat, you know, but if you don't know where D flat is, 
good luck. And so we want to go ahead and again have, a, have the value scale with us uh, for at least six months. Uh, I recommend people have the, 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 the grayscale with them for at least the first three years of learning to draw and paint. But uh, it's really great to have, you know, to have one of these available so that you can judge your values much more accurately. Okay, we're going to get rid of that. Uh, we're going to be using pencils. Now, we're only going to be using one of five. I could use a full range if I wanted to. If I wanted to get the, a full you know, pencil kit that starts with a 9H and goes all the way down to 8B, you could certainly do that. Uh, but we're just going to we're going to start off again with a simplification. We're going to start off with five of the most common pencils that you're going to use. And sometimes someone you'll see this and I'm like, oh, I don't need all those pencils. I can do everything with my number two pencil. And uh, and that may be true. Uh, but you're going to have to really kind of push in on the paper. You're going to have to brutalize the paper. You're going to be destroying the paper essentially to try to make that pencil give you the full range. So. Um, again, this is our, our five pencils that we have in the, in, the, uh, in the drawing class. The H pencils are our lighter pencils. The B pencils are our darker pencils. And we start off with a 4H. With the H pencils, the higher the number, the lighter the pencil. So our 4H is the lightest pencil. We have a 2H, which is darker than the 4H, but lighter than... We'll, we'll talk about this pencil in a minute, but it's called an HB. So this, we're starting from lightest going to darkest. So we have a 2H, which is darker than the 4H, but lighter than the HB. We have the HB, which is like a number two pencil, and it's a pretty good workhorse. If, uh, if you don't hear me tell you to use a certain pencil, you're going to be using an HB pencil. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, in terms of... Our B pencils, we have a 2B, which again is darker than our HB pencil. With the B pencils, the higher the number, the darker the pencil. So as these go higher, they go, li they go lighter. So a 9H would be up here, lighter than any of these. Uh, and as these numbers go down, they get darker. Uh, so they get a 2B, and then we have, this is a little 4B. And the reason I've got it in this thing is because he's, he's a short pencil. Uh, I've been using them. And so what you can do is you can get these little pencil extenders and now I've, I've lengthened out my pencil, okay? So 4H, 2H, HB, 2B, 4B, all right? And these are the pencils we're going to use. Um, and we're gonna be layering these pencils back and forth depending on where we are on the value scale. Now I talked about on, the, on this value scale that we ha we're gonna have, the lightest is gonna be a step 10 going down to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 will be the absolute darkest we can, we can do. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start off here with the, uh, you know, with, with the darkest um, part or the darkest one which is going to be number one and because it's going to be the darkest I'm going to go ahead and use my 4B pencil now I'm only going to be I'm going to be using a a probably a wrist swing just to save a little bit of time as far as that goes and so and we're going to be using a side to side motion and I don't care so much if I, if I break out the sides. I want to be very cautious of where they meet. But in terms of breaking outside this, this rectangle, I'm really not as worried about that. And so, and again, if I wanted to keep this clean, I could tape it off uh, to use tape as a mask. Or, but if I wanted to, you know, if, if I tried to stay inside that line, and I might say, well, that's, that's, that's great for those that want to take the extra time. But I understand that if I try to stay in the lines, I could do it, but it's going to take me four times as long. So um, we're going to try to make this a little quicker the first time around. So again, we're just moving this side to side. Uh, I'm using a actually an elbow swing because I'm so far off the paper. But if I was closer to it, I'd probably be using a wrist swing uh, because I don't need to. You know, I, I don't really need that much range of motion. It's just that I, I'm so far away from this. I can't, and I don't want to cover, you know, the camera 
that I'm using, again, my, my entire elbow to create this. And again, we're just going side to side. Okay, I'm using this 4B pencil, and I'm just, I'm trying to overlap the previous lines. And I'm using light pressure. That's another important thing. We, you know, we're, we don't want to crank on this. In fact, I, I'm using about the lightest touch I can, I can. And, uh, you know, sometimes I refer to it, you know, as, as you know, whatever, butterfly kisses on angel wing soft, but you're just trying to use as delicate and as soft a pressure as you can. And sometimes people are like, well, how can I, how can I get it dark then if I'm not cranking on it? And the, and the thing is, is you're going to have to allow, first off, you're going to, it's going to take patience, but whenever you overlap graphite, it builds on itself. It goes darker. Um, and so instead of cranking down on this, which, by the way, makes the graphite go shiny very quickly. It really shoves the graphite into the paper. And once you've done that, you're never going to get that paper back down to white again. And so if I was doing something very complex like a face or, you know, drawing an eye or something like that, I want to be able to lift stuff out with my erasers. I want to be able to manipulate it. I want to be able to create textures and things of that nature. And if I, if I crank too hard on this, I will destroy my ability to be able to work with the graphite in, a, in as a effective a manner but because of the fact that I've destroyed the paper and, and I've pushed the graphite into inside the paper itself and there's no getting that out uh, entirely. I mean you can lighten the surface stuff but the stuff that's gotten into the fibers of the paper is not coming out unless you go in there with like a Brillo pad or something like that. Um, some of the old electric erasers used to have like a uh, some of these erasers that were very uh, gritty, abrasive, and yeah, they'd get it out, but you'd actually be taking off layers of paper, which is also again not a good thing if you're trying to keep your paper um, looking like it hasn't been destroyed or or treated you know in an unfair way. Uh, so we're gonna. I'm, I'm going over this and over this and allowing the pencil to build this up. Now with graphite, it takes the longest to make the darker passages. Whenever we're working with graphite, it, we we need to have um, patience. So we've got this here, and I'm just gonna. I need to get rid of this. I should have a, my brush with me, but I don't. So I'll blow that off. Now usually that's a, that's a bad habit to do that. But um, I, I don't have my drafting brush, but that's, you know, and I don't want to just do that with my hand because that would smear it. But we're going to layer this because people are like, well, wait a minute, that's not as dark as that. That's not as dark as that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. It's not as dark as that. So what we're going to do to make it darker, and again, you really have to use, you know, again, that light pressure. This is a 4H pencil. Okay, it's a 4H. Now, these pencils that I'm using are Kimberly, but you could use any sort of paper, um, pencil. You could use, um, you know, Prismacolor or what have you. Uh, there are lots of, of good brands of pencils out there um, as far as that goes. You could use Derwent or what have you or Staedtler or some of those other mainstream pencils. But this is a 4H. And we're going to use layering of pencils to get this darker. But I have to use this. The 4H are harder. They're literally harder pencils. And it's really easy to carve uh, gullies and valleys into paper with these because they are so hard. Uh, some of the H pencils are so hard that if they're sharpened, they will cut your paper like a razor blade. Uh, we don't use the 9H because of that fact. It's just if you're not very delicate with that, it's going to destroy the paper. And this is our 4H, same thing. We have to be very, very, very delicate with this. But, and this is our lightest pencil. But when I do this, people go, hold on a minute. You said that's the lightest pencil. And I say, yep, that is the lightest pencil. And they say, well, wait a minute. Why is that getting darker where you're using that pencil? If that's the lightest pencil, why is it getting darker? I don't understand how that works. And what's happening is that with the, the softer pencils skip over the texture more. The harder pencils, without having to press harder, it's just because of the fact they are harder, they go deeper into the texture. They don't ride over the top of the texture the same way. 
And so what's happening is with this 4H, it's getting deeper into the paper and it's turning these white little dots into gray little dots. And because you're lowering those white dots to a light gray, the whole thing is getting darker. So I wanted to just show you this where I've done this half with just the 4H pencil. And this half has not been done with the 4H pencil. I, you know, I haven't put a layer on top of it. And because I haven't put a layer on top of this half, it's lighter because of all that little, those little dots showing through. So that's what layering the pencils will help us do. It'll help us get a better range of value. You can also get, you know, we can control texture this way. If I'm trying to draw something that's um, like a, a steel ball bearing or something like that, steel marble or something of that nature, or even a glass marble or, or a glass or something of that nature, um, I, I usually want a surface that doesn't have texture. It's supposed to be slick. Or if I'm drawing chrome or metal or something like that, same thing. I want it to be slick. And so by minimizing the texture, this will also look smoother. So I've, I've done a couple layers with this 4H. And after I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and put that aside. And I'm going to grab myself a 2H pencil. So this 2H is softer than the 4H, but it's still harder than all the other pencils. So this will go a little, you know, it'll, it won't go as deep as the 4H, but it will go deeper than any of my other pencils aside from that 4H pencil. And so again, this is filling in or darkening some of those little bits of texture, again, to make this more uniform, which in turn will make this seem more, um, will make it seem darker. Well, it won't seem darker, it will be darker because we are making it darker. And so again, I'm gonna go ahead and put, now I'm trying to go ahead and at least, you know, give a nod to the fact that, you know, this is where this ends. So I, I don't wanna ignore that, but I, I'm also not, again, what I'm really want to want to what I really want to pay attention to is this edge right here. You want that good and clean. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and continue to now. Even the angle of the pencil will will also if I've got a, a pencil that's more perpendicular that will get deeper into the the paper, but it will also dig more. So you got to be careful. The more I'm more um, parallel to the paper, the more it'll write on top. So again, just the angle of the pencil will change the look or how much, t how much of that texture in the paper will express itself based on the angle of my pencil. It's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, when you get used, when you've been drawing for a bit and you, you understand that, you can create textures and details really quickly because you understand how to control the pencil in a better way. So I've put a couple layers with that. I'm gonna put the 2H aside, uh, and I'm gonna now grab my HB. Now again, the HB won't go as deep as the 2H, and it certainly won't go as deep as the 4H, but it will also, it, it, it'll, uh, it'll darken some of, again, the outside, you know, the, of those little dots. So part of those dots are gonna be darkening a little bit more there's others that aren't going to be touched because this can't go as deep. But again, just by using this, and again, I could do this over just half of this real quick to, to, to bring this home. If the, you know, on the half that I've used this on, it looks darker. Um, and I could do, I, the more I, I go over it, the more it'll build up, the darker it will seem. Now there is something we have to be careful with, with graphite. This is also why, why we are layering. This is also why we are taking our time. Uh, and darks are the hardest thing with graphite because it takes a while, as you can see, to build up to a nice, rich dark. Okay, that now I'm using a finger swing. When I'm trying to use control, this is where I'll get in here with my, you know, again, a finger swing, smaller areas, that sort of thing 
that's when we would do this, right? But if you uh, try to go too dark too quickly or press too hard, as graphite starts to get shiny the darker it gets. Uh, and in fact, there's a point at which you have to leave it alone because it won't, even if you put more graphite on it, it won't look darker. It'll begin to be shinier and shinier and start to look lighter and lighter. So that there's a, there's a, that sheen in, in graphite is, some people don't care for that. They like the more matte appearance and so they'll, that's why they work in charcoal. Uh, and, and even some artists that are graphite artists will be careful not to go past a certain step of value because after that it's just going to go so shiny that it's hard to look at. It's hard to see the drawing because it becomes so shiny. So because of that some people have, have resorted to uh, using combinations of carbon pencils with graphite and stuff like that. And, and you can certainly do it, but you do that, but you have to make sure it's well integrated or it won't look right. It'll start to look, you know, it will, it will look like patches of different material. It's hard to describe unless you've actually seen it. Um, but the idea is that if I, uh, if I was working in watercolor and then all of a sudden I put some white gouache on there, the white gouache stands out because you've gone from transparent layers to suddenly opaque layers of paint and even across the room it just jumps. You can tell that, that something has really changed and it's the same thing with with graphite and carbon pencils. You have to make extra, you have to take extra care that they're integrated and we're not going to get a ton of that today but that's anyways. Um, so now I've got my 2B pencil so now we're getting you know this the 2B is the second to the darkest pencil. The only thing darker than the 2B of my five would be that 4B pencil. So I'm going to put a couple layers and this has gone much darker. By, by doing all this layering it allows the, the pencils to build on themselves easier. It's gotten in there and gotten rid of a lot of that, that, that texture uh, and now again it, it, start, it just continues to build. And so I could put a couple layers of this on here. And by doing that, now I can grab my 4B pencil and we can, we can go over this a couple more times. And now, it's actually gotten pretty dark, but if this will, it'll actually go darker now than it would have before. So again, by layering, I actually am going to get a nice, deeper, richer uh, darks with my 4B pencil. So we're, we're constantly, unless we don't need to, there's going to be some up here we will hardly layer at all but because they're so light. But we'll go ahead and again put a couple layers on here. And we're going to try to get this to go as dark as we can get it. Now if I really wanted to uh, Sometimes, you know, if we don't have, if we have like lines, we can see what's called the grain. Like if you're not using your pencil and overlapping it, you'll start to get little lines. And you'll start to see those lines. If you're not, if you're not careful, they'll just always be there. And so if you want to, you can actually start going different directions. I can go top to bottom, you know, top to bottom, side to side, and then diagonal one way and then diagonal the other way. And by doing that, you can actually start to get rid of any vestiges of grain from your pencil skipping, you know, where you didn't overlap it enough, so there's a little bit of a line left between the two. That will start to leave sort of a grain or a directional line. And the way to get rid of those, if you're really having an issue, is to go ahead and crosshatch. And that just means take your lines different directions. And that's what I'm doing right now. It's just to make sure this is as even and dark as I can possibly get it. I'm using a finger swing now again because I'm I'm in here trying to have more control. So I start out with a with a an elbow swing and, and we talk about this in the class. 
you know, using the elbow swing, using the wrist swing, using a pencil, and with that pencil using a finger swing. I'm using a finger swing right now. And I'm not doing the, I'm not doing a feathered stroke, or some people people call it a tapered stroke. Um, we're not we're not doing that right now. We're just scooting this back and forth. Uh, so this is. I'm using my fingers, but it's not near as, it's not the more complicated. Tapered stroke and or feathered stroke, depending on who you talk to. So we've got that, and that's about as rich, dark, as I can as I could want. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to come up to the step nine because we're going to leave ten as just as white paper. And so what we would do with this is we're going to take our we're going to take, you know, take our pencil. And this is a 4H pencil, and that line is too dark. So you can't have this line be darker than the value you're going to create. And right now, this line here is too dark, so I'm going to lighten it up first. This is the only one that's going to be a problem because all these other ones are going to be darker. I'm going to grab this 4H pencil. Now this is the, one of the hardest ones because of the fact that the 4-H is very unforgiving if you leave spaces between your lines. Okay, so we, we, we got to take our time. So sometimes people are like, why am I doing grayscales? Well the grayscales, because they're like, oh it's so boring, I don't want to do that. But the, the great thing about grayscales is it really helps you dial in to your technique. So if I'm using, again, my, I'm using a wrist swing, I'm using a modified uh, tripod grip in terms of the way I'm holding the pencil. There's a little bit of spacing now I'm using my, I'm trying to use a little more control. So we've got our finger swing in here. Okay. And again, the reason that this is such a good exercise is because it, it, it takes away all the detail. We're not dealing with detail. We're not dealing with complex contours. We're just focusing on value. And not only that, but we're trying to make the value, these chunks of value, as uniform as we possibly can. You have to have a whole lot of control to be able to do a successful grayscale because if I've got too much texture, if there's too many spaces between my lines, if these values that I'm creating are not uniform, the illusion will not be created. And so we want to be, you want to be able to, to, to practice this enough so that you can actually make a halfway decent grayscale um, or even a, you know, a successful grayscale. And um, usually something like this, if you've never done a grayscale, to do, to do one that's, you know, you take your time. A lot of times when we first sit down to drawing, we're in too much of a hurry. We want too much for too little time. Um, you know, for me to, to do a, a decent grayscale will take me upwards of 45 minutes. You know, just go ahead and get into your zen state. Put on your favorite music, you know, and, and, and start, start drawing. Just go ahead and ease on in get used to get used to being there you're going to probably be there if you're a first timer you're going to be having a hard time to do a decent one in in an hour or two hours not uncommon because it's going to be a bit of a struggle but through the struggle we learn that's you're going to you're going to improve your technique you're going to start to you know because you're constantly going to say oh let's see I, I i opened up those lines too quickly oh i need to overlap them a little bit more oh i need to take my time a little bit more oh i need to you know, A, B, C, or D, uh, you know, you're just going to keep, keep looking, keep trying your best and, and doing what you need to do.
to get as uniform a value as you possibly can. So now with the step nine, the other thing that people will do, and so we're trying to do something similar to this value right here. Many times they'll make it too dark or they'll make it so light that it doesn't, you know, it's got to be dark enough that we can tell there's a difference between this to this. It's got to be dark enough, but it can't be too dark. It can't be this one. That would be too dark. And so we want to go ahead and make this again as uniform as we can possibly make it. Okay. We're going to go ahead and again take our time. We're going to look down here and say, hey, is there any patches that are uneven? Are there any patches where it's a little sketchy? Are there any places that need my attention? And again, some, sometimes people are like, well, this is not this is not super fun. And again, this is like scales, doing scales on a piano or chords on, you know, or, or whatever. But um, if I had a little stronger music background, I could probably use some a little better analogies. But this is, this is like doing wind sprints for, you know, basketball and stuff like that. It's a warm up. But the better, you, the better you can do the wind sprints, the better you can run, the more power you have, the quicker you are on the basketball court, the better the, your advantage against your opponents. The better that you can identify your values, the better you can recreate them, the better advantage you will have with your artwork being more accurate. So again, this is pretty close, you know, in terms of those, those two values. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to, we're going to use what we call a staggered, a staggered approach to doing this. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to come down here to step five, okay, and I'm going to use my um, I'm going to use my HB pencil. My HB pencil is the pencil that's right in the middle of all these other pencils. This step is right in the middle, so guess what? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead now. When I do this, I'm going to try to focus on these two values and I'm going to try to make this right in between the two. So instead of starting at 9 and coming all the way down and hoping I get the right values, we're going to use again this this staggered approach to creating this grayscale. So I'm going to come over here. I've got this HP pencil. Now I also am going to start off a little bit on the lighter side. Because again, this is a B pencil, so I'm going to have to layer it. If I went too dark to begin with, and I start doing all that layering, which is going to make it darker, again, I could, I could get myself into some real trouble. So I'm going to start off with, again, a little lighter. It's a little patchy through there, so I'm going to fill that in. There's like a, two little circles here I need to fill in over here. There's a little bit of a sort of a little rectangle right there. So I'm looking for any variation and if there's variation, you know, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to fill it in. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my my 4H and again we're going to get rid of all those little white dots. So I'm going to start with my 4H. Now again, I don't care if it comes out the side, but I do have to take care of these two lines where it's going to meet the other values. So I'm now actually using I'm, I'm using a little bit of a wrist swing, but I, I'm, I'm so I just need more control. I might I might start using a finger swing in some areas because again, that's where you have the most control. I'm using a tripod grip, and again, I'm I'm moving just my wrist. Okay. You also, again, this is really about technique. How am I holding the pencil? What's the angle of the pencil? How light am I using the pencil? How much am I overlapping? Again, this is all technique. This helps you really get down the technique of how to use the pencil and how to control it. So if you're drawing something that's more fun, but you, you don't know how to 
control the pencil, you're gonna have you're, you're probably not gonna end up with something that's gonna be as successful. Just like if I was again playing the piano, and I was like, I want to do some you know some fun song that's much more advanced than Mary Had a Little Lamb, and so you're trying to do some other song, uh, maybe you know, variation on a theme by Paganini or something like that. Um, and you're trying to, you know, play that, but you're still fumbling over the keys, and you can't hear the, the keys very cleanly, and your fingers, are, again, are fumbling over the, you know, the keys, and you're, you don't really have the rhythm, and you haven't learned yet how to, to deal with, you know, timing and, and all that good stuff, the tempo and everything like that when you're playing piano you're not again you're not going to have a very successful song because you don't understand really how to play the piano very well so you need so you're going to be much more successful with that song if you take the time to practice you know if you take your time to you know practice some uh you know playing some simpler songs really focusing in on you know playing your, your, your chords and things like that to get your fingers a little more nimble. You know, practicing on, on stretching, the, being able to open those fingers up and having a better stretch through your, your different, again, your keys and being able to hit that key in a very clean, proper way. And again, if you do that, you're going to start to have much more success. And not only that, but learning how to deal with half notes and whole notes and quarter notes and eighth notes and all that good good stuff knowing by looking very quickly that that note and where does it sit on the treble clef or the bass clef you know knowing that and understanding that and being able to do it on the fly instinctively because you've trained yourself so much well now you're talking about you're going to start having the skills to uh to play some really good songs if you were you know, trying to push it to, let's say you want to go and play the piano in a professional sort of a realm. Well, you're going to be you're going to be dealing and practicing, you know, your scales and stuff just to warm up your hands. And you might be practicing scales, warming your hands up for 30 minutes to 40 minutes, long before you even touch a sheet of music, because you need to get your 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 hands and your fingers nimble. You need to get them warmed up. You need to be able to hit your keys very cleanly. You plus need, need to keep the tempo and the rhythm and all those many things that goes into playing a, a great piece of music in a professional way. It's the same. So when you're starting out, of course, you, you have to develop those skills. You have to learn, you know, the bass clef and the treble clef. And you're gonna you want to learn it so well that you could identify a note, you know, in your sleep or being awoken from a deep sleep. You could say, oh yeah, that's a uh, you know that's D flat now leave me alone or whatever but you know you want to be able to very quickly identify and understand these different concepts I had an acquaintance okay this is my 4H we're now going to transition to a 2H and I'm going to continue with my my analogy here but I had a friend and um, it's all about mastery is what this boils down to stuff like this is really about mastering the fundamentals but I had this friend that was a world-class uh, juggler. He was a street performer and a world-class juggler. And I'm trying to remember, I think he could juggle, I think he was trying to learn to juggle nine. I think he could juggle eight balls, which you're essentially juggling four balls in each hand. It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, or maybe he could do 70 years to work on eight. It was something like that. Um, but he would talk about how you had to be able to juggle so much of a particular set of number of these different you know balls or what have you or you know he also did the the little bottles they look like bottles um, they're not called that but um, anyways and the rings and all this sort of stuff but no matter what it was he's like you want you have to do it well enough that it gets you know into your subconscious that again you could wake you up someone could wake me up from asleep and he would actually have people do that they'd actually have okay I want you to come in I'm gonna be taking a nap today I want you to wake me up and I want you to hand me these many things. And he would check himself to see if, it, if he'd gotten there yet. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that... that now, that might be, 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 be beyond, you know, what most people want to do. And that's fine. If you're like, look, I'm not trying to, 
you know, set a world record and I'm not trying to, you know, do this for a professional, that's fine. And I, I certainly understand that. And I'm not saying that's, that, that, that that's the only thing to do. But what I am saying is that if you want to learn to play the piano, you have to be able to know the, know the notes. You have to know what notes you're looking at. You have to know where it is on the keyboard. You have to then play it correctly. And you have to, you know, make it a nice clean hit on that, you know, tap onto that key and, you know, all that good stuff. You have to know what the tempo is. You have to know all this different stuff. And the more you do it, the better you'll be. The more you draw, the better you'll be. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really that simple. It's not, it's not any more complicated than, than that. It's a very simple concept. So I've gone over this a couple times with this. With this um, now, I have to be careful because, again, this value here is, again, somewhere. It's almost here. It's between those two. So understand that this 5 won't be the same as this one over here. So I'm trying to look between these two values and judge when it's at its halfway point. Um, I think this is at the halfway point. There's a better to be lighter because you can always darken. If you have to lighten this with a, an eraser, oh my goodness, it's going to be a mess because it's going to be all splotchy. You're going to have to get in there with your kneaded eraser and do different things and it's just going to be an absolute mess. So better to be a little bit lighter and then have it, the ability to go darker than to be too dark because that's where it really, I'd have to erase it and then it would take me probably an hour to take out the blotchiness. Uh, well, maybe an hour might be a bit much, but at least 20 minutes to get that to, you know, to where I could then start to push it down in a uniform way, making it slightly darker or, you know, patch it up so that it's uniform in that lighter value, whatever it is I'm doing. Um, it's, it's just going to be much, much more difficult. So I'm using this 2H. Now, something about the 2Hs and the 4Hs, they're really great for um, darkening something in a, you know, because we don't want to go too, you don't want to go darker. Because again, we just talked about the eraser and having to get in there and it's going to make it really blotchy. And then you have to fill in all the blotches so it doesn't look like it has polka dots. And you have to fill it in so that it, it melts in like it's completely uniform. That's a hard thing to do. And so better to sneak up on it. But because of the fact that I've got these H pencils, they don't, they darken it very slowly. And in fact, there's a point at which they won't, won't go darker at all. But I have right now a 2H, and I'm using this 2H to make this more uniform. And it's, it's great because um, if I went over with one stroke with an HB, it probably it might go too dark. Whereas this, to, to make that same darkness of stroke, I'd have to go over it like 16 times. So I ha it's a little bit easier to fine tune on the, on the lighter side, and sometimes even the darker side with my H pencils. They're really great for fine tuning a value. And I think this is going to be about where we want to, I want to stop here because I think we're ready to go forward. Again, we would go ahead and either go lighter or darker, but we, you know, we have three between here and three between here. So if we skip one, there's the one in between, there's the one in between. We're going to get use this staggered approach because now I'm going to try to make a value that's not this light, not this dark, but somewhere in between. Now I started this one with an HB. The next one lighter is the 2H, so I'm going to start this one with a 2H. Remember, this one had my 4H that I started with up there. And so again, I'm going to go ahead and come over here. And I'm going to start with my 2H pencil. And again, the 10 is left white because that's white. That's white paper. Now, usually with drawing paper, they're not truly white. So I was, remember I was saying, well, it's not truly white. Nothing's truly white. And and there's there's times that's 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 true, but uh, most times on paper, it's, it's not truly white anyway. So we're already at the 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 paper value itself is is a true step 10 where it's not it's not white at all. It's an off white or you know a light cream or you know something that's around. Again, that's sort of a, that's step 10 uh, because it's, it's not truly white. The, to get true white paper, they have to bleach it, and, and they're usually called bright white. Well, that's a true white. Uh, this is not bright white. This is actually somewhere between bright white and ivory. So again, the paper itself is, is actually a step 10. 
So I'm using a wrist swing. I've got a modified, um, I've got a modified handhold, the tripod grip. It's a modified tripod grip. Um, if you if you don't know that, go ahead and about the handholds. Watch the video that talks about the handholds. Um, if you if you haven't taken one of my classes before, my very first class I, I want people to take is the foundation of line, or the power of line is the is the actual name of it. The power of line, the foundation of all drawing. Uh, and it talks about those handholds. Now I'm also going to have sort of a, a view, a review of handholds as well in this class. But there's certain things in, in that class I am not going to review. I'm just going to assume you know it and go on. Uh, and so we learned about things like armature of the rectangle. We learned about things like um, how to break things down. Uh, with uh, the armature into halves and quarters and thirds and two-thirds and all that good stuff. We also learned about measuring and proportional measuring and how to use it. We, used it, we talked about construction and how to use construction and you know we talked a little bit about how you know to make a drawing and, and using the using our, our drawing board and, and, and placing it on our knees and the table to then have a surface that is, you know, nice and flat and everything. So if you haven't, if that, if some of that stuff sound, and we're going to, of course, be doing contour drawings uh, and then filling those contour drawings with value. If, if you don't, if some of those sound strange to you, I'd really encourage you to take the class, the power of line, the foundation of all great drawing. And so it, it's a wonderful class. So I'm going to stay with the 2H because I, if I, I might use a 4H though. So let's go a little, little lighter because that'll fill in some of the, it'll make it a little smoother. It'll fill in some of that and it'll also go a little darker. So I was going to stay with just the 2H and I could have done that, but I decided, you know what? It's a little splotchy. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this 4H pencil and we're going to fill in some of those areas that need filling in so it doesn't look splotchy. And again, we have to make sure that, again, with this one and these as well, we have to really respect those lines. We want those as clean a line as we can possibly make them. And the better we can make really good lines, the better the, this will look. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going we're gonna to come back here. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back and we're going to finish this. All right.